Hi guys, uh, today I'll uh, introduce a theorem that we can use to prove some uh, results of number theory and uh, proof theory. Um, so I'll start by stating the theorem, proving it, and then prove the consequent results. So the theorem is, let x be a finite set. Here, prime number. Um, let a function be defined on x with x such that the function iterated p times is the identity. So that's the notation for f done p times. Um, let x not denote. The set of fixed points. Fixed points of f. Um, that is just the uh, x and x such that f of x is equal to x. Then what the theorem tells us is that if you count the number of elements in x, so that's the Carnelli of x, which is finite is equal, congruent to x naught, the cardinality of x naught mod p. So it's basically just a counting theorem that lets us uh, relate the number of points in x to the number of fixed points. Theorem clear? Let's try to prove it. So what do we want? Um, we want to write the cardinality of x as some n times p plus cardinality of x naught. Right? That's what the congruence means. Um, so for that, uh, consider an element x and x. Uh, I define the orbit of x, and I denote it like this, to be all the places that x can visit if you keep applying f to it. So this is f of x, I've applied two times, three times, so that's f to the p minus 1x, and note that uh, f to the p of x is just the identity, so it comes back to itself on the p iteration. Um, the first thing to know about orbits is that um, orbits partition x. So what that basically means is that for all x and y in x, Either their orbits are equal, or their orbits are disjoint. Now, the way to see that is um, just assume that the orbits are not disjoint. Assume that the orbits are not disjoint. So you have like an element z, say, in this intersection. So that means z is f to the n of x for some n. And z is also f to the m of y. Um, for some y. So it's in the orbit of y and orbit of x, right? Now without loss of generality, zoom n is less than equal to n. Then we can write f of n of x 
So z equals to z. So f n of x equals f n of y. Then just apply f to the p minus n on both sides. So iterate it further. What you get is f to the p minus n of the plan of x, p minus n, n, y. That gives us f to the p of x. And this is f to the p plus m minus n of x. Note that f to the p of x is itself. And f to the m minus n, f to the p, you do f to the p first and then m minus n. So you go to x first and then basically end up at f to the m minus n. So that means that x is in the orbit. So these are y's, sorry. So yeah, those are y's. Um, so that means x is in the orbit of y, right? Which immediately implies that orbit of x is contained in orbit of y. So once you get to x, you just keep going forward. like. If, let's say, f squared of x is x, uh, f squared of y is x, then the rest is just the orbit of x contained in the orbit of y. Now, well, this also tells us, like, if we write x is um, fj of y, where j is m minus n, you can do a similar trick over here and apply f to the, didn't do it here, apply f to the p minus j on both sides, you get that f to the p minus j of x is equal to y, because f to the p of y is still y. So that tells us that y is in the orbit of x, right, because you wrote y as some function power of x, which implies that orbit of y itself is contained in orbit of x. So you see that orbit of x is contained in orbit of y, and orbit of y is contained in orbit of x. So orbit of y is equal to orbit of x. So that um, shows our claim that orbits do partition x Now, uh, the next thing to note is that for any fixed point, we have by definition f of x is equal to x, right? So for such an x, the orbit size, um, can anyone guess what the orbit size is for a fixed point? One. 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 Okay. Yeah, so at least you guys are following what the orbit is. <laughs> um, yeah, so the orbit size is just one. Um, so that's great. Now, the next claim is that if you have an x such that the orbit size is greater than one, then the orbit size actually must be p, um, p itself. So to see that um, proof of claim, so assume that the orbit size is less than p, right? Assume that it's less than p. Now, what happens is that if it's less than p, we get some duplication over here in this list. So there exists i and j both greater than 0 and without loss of generality, i is smaller than j. 
such that f to the i of x is equal to f to the j of x. Right? It's like there's some duplication. Um, now apply again f to the p minus i on both sides. What do we get is that here on this side we get f to the p of x is equal to f to the p minus i plus j of x. And f to the p of x is just the identity, uh, f to the p is just the identity, so this is just x is equal to f to the j minus i of x. Because here also f to the p is the identity. I'm going to leave the um, theorem statement up for the rest of the talk. But this one. So what we have over there um, is x is equal to f to the j minus i of x, right? And also note, I can't, can't say it enough, but <laughs> f to the p of x is equal to x. Um, now, P is a prime. J and I are actually both smaller than P. So J minus I is definitely smaller than P. Um, and positive, because without loss of generality, we pick J to be greater. So the GCD, J minus I and P, is 1. Right? So you can write 1 as, you know, a p plus b j minus i, and again without loss of generality, you can pick um, one of them, one of the coefficients, to be positive, right? Otherwise, if they're both negative, then uh, well, negative plus minus negative is smaller than one, right? Um, so. Without loss of geometry, a is greater than zero, which forces b to be smaller than zero. And one is equal to what is it? I'm going to write this as that, which is the same as b j minus i a p. And now, if you apply f to the a p to x then what you've done is you've applied H to f to the b j minus i plus 1 to the x. Um, this is just applying p a times. So this is just x. And here we know that f to the j minus i is also the identity. So you've applied it uh, b times. So that's still the identity. So that becomes f to the x because you still have a plus one in here, right? So you've shown that x is actually fx. So that means x is in the fixed point. So our standing assumption that orbit of x is greater than one is contradicted, right? So that's great. So now we're almost done with this group. So now what happens? Um, is that since x is partitioned by its orbits, right? The variety of so x can be written as union of disjoint orbits. Right? Because x is partitioned. Now the variety of x then is um, the number of uh, so the cardinality of the union <laughs> of the disjoint orbits. Now we said that the orbits can only be size p and size 1, right? So it should be n times p for n, um, the number of orbits of size p, plus the number of orbits of size 1, which are just the number of fixed points, right? 
So that is congruent to that's not my Right? So that proves our theorem. That's what we wanted. Um, and we've gotten it. Now let's see some uh, applications of this theorem real quick. Is everyone who's fairly following so far? Um, the first application is uh, Cauchy's theorem. Four groups. I guess he has a bunch of theorems. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what does Cauchy's theorem actually say? Uh, if you, G, if you have G a finite set, a uh, finite group, finite group, um, and P a prime dividing order of G, which we call N, then there exists an element in G of order P. And for those of you who haven't taken group theory in a while, um, the order of an element is just the, the minimum power that it can be raised to to get the identity. Um, also, the number of such elements must be congruent to negative one mod two. So let's prove this. <coughs> I said uh, there are uh, multiple different ways to prove it. Uh, even algebra trade I think. But I'm going to use try to use this theorem. I'm going to follow uh, what I need for these theorems as my steps for the proof. So step one is setting x um, x as in the set that we use in this theorem. Um, and I'm going to set it as the set of p tuples xp, where all the individual elements are coming from g, and with the further condition that their product x1 to xp is the identity. Um, just combinatorially, you can now find what the order of x is. <coughs> now, to find the order of x, there are, well, you can use different strategies, I guess, but the one I was like using was um, to note that for every spot in this p-tuple, you have um, well, the cardinal of G is N, right? You have N choices, right, for every spot, except for the last spot where you're forced to pick the inverse of the product of the first P minus one. So I'm gonna write that down. Um, for each spot, for each spot in this P tuple, You have n choices, except for the last one. Where you are forced to pick the inverse of xi times x1 times x x3 p minus 1. Right? So in effect, you actually have just p minus one free choices, um, because you know this equation brings down the degree of freedom, basically. Um, so since we have p minus one free choices out of n elements, then the cardinality of x is just g to the p minus one. Right? And 
Note that this is congruent to 0 mod p, because the standing assumption is that p divides the order of g. So that's step one. Step two is seven f, right? And we want the p power to be the identity. So the natural thing when you look at p tuples, setting f is um, it's going to be just a piece like a cyclic permutation. So x to the p maps to x two, x p, x one. Now, um, you might be wondering if this is actually, if this element is actually inside um, x or not, that it satisfies those conditions. Well, it satisfies the first condition because all the x2s are, all the elements, individual elements are still in G. But to note that um, if the product is still the identity, you see that x1 to xp being an entity implies if you just conjugate both sides by x1 inverse, xp, x1, right? So you just get these cancel out. So you're left with x2, xp, x1, e. So it does satisfy the second condition as well. Um, and note, I just mentioned that this before, so just, just right now, but like f to the p, still the identity because if you do p permutations, like cyclic permutations, you come back to it. <coughs> now let's move on to the third step, which is to find uh, our fixed points. So step three is find x naught and it's that um, Now note that if I have a p-tuple, this is my notation for the p-tuple, um, in x naught, then this, this means f is the same as itself, f of that is the same as itself. Um, which is just translating into tuple language xp, or rather x2, x1, right? And that means that x1 is equal to x2. Similarly, x2 is equal to x3, um, all the way down, xp is equal to x1, right? Just equating the and I guess elements, individual elements. That implies that x1 is equal to x2, x3, all the way down to x2. Right? So, which is uh, equivalent to x just being, x not just being all these elements, p tuples who have the same coordinates basically. Um, so a and g, and a to the p is the identity. So if you observe, x naught is contains all the elements of order p plus also the identity, right? Because like, you can also take e, 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 and trivially get e to the p is e. So noting that we have that the number of elements in x naught is basically one, which corresponds to the identity, plus um, yeah, number of elements, elements of order p. Right. So applying the theorem. Apply now theorem one. What we get is x 
is equivalent to f naught mod p from the theorem. And we saw that this is congruent to 0 earlier, uh, which is congruent to here 1 plus number of um, p order elements mod p. So this implies that the number of elements of order p is actually coming into negative 1 mod p. So that proves our theorem, uh, Cauchy's theorem. So now, how much time do you have? About five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. I, I think it's enough to go through okay. another proof because it's very similar. Um, so that's one major theorem from group theory that we manipulated, well, that, that we used this theorem to prove. The next theorem we want to talk about is from number theory, which is um, Fermat's new theorem. So that says that n to the p is coming to n mod p. Here also, we'll break it into steps. Step one is sending x. Now, very similar to the vein we used here uh, in the Cauchy's theorem, we set x to be all these p tuples, xp such that all the xi are integers now, and with the added condition that they lie between 1 to n inclusive. So you can think of it combinatorially as having n choices for each of these places. Or you can think of this as an R2, the integer lattice, uh, just cut out between like 1 and n. So the number of elements, at least combinatorially, it's easier to see. Well, if it's deep, I guess if it's two tuples, so you can just count in the R2 plane. But combinatorially, you have n choices for each of these um, spots. So the size of x is just n to the p, right? And uh, step two, step two is find an f. I'm going to set the f to the same thing. f goes from x to x such that these tuples are just cyclically shifted. x2, xp, x1. Right? Uh, you didn't change any of the elements, so of course it's still going to be an x, so it's well defined. Um, the order of p is still, if you raise f, if you do p times, uh, if you do fp times, then you still are the identity, which is great. Uh, then step three is find x naught. Now, it's the same process of finding x naught uh, as you found it in Cauchy's theorem. So x naught is just going to be a set of elements a such that a is in the G to z, and a is between 1 to n. Because um, you can do the same argument as x1 is equal to x2, x2 is equal to x3. So you get all, all, all the elements of this form. Now, it's easy to count x naught here. Because you have, you know, all these elements, 1, 1, 2, 2, all the way to n. So you just have n elements and fix that. Then you can apply theorem 1. You get x is coming into x naught mod p, 
which is basically saying that NGDP is coming into the NYP. So that does, um, so that proves Fermat's theorem as well. Yeah, that's what I'm going Actually, you thought like I was gonna squeeze in a fourth uh, proof, <laughs> but clearly not. Um, but I can save the theorem if you want. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, it's uh, it's another theorem from uh, number theory. I don't know if you're familiar with it. I wasn't actually until I looked this up. It's called uh, Lucas's theorem, and the proof is much more complex than what we what we just did. Um, so if you have n written as n1 plus nmp plus nk is in k, um, so p, p of prime, r is r0 plus r1p plus rk p2k, such that n i r i are strictly less than p. So it's sort of like the p adic representation of that comma? And it, the integers, yeah. 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 This is a comma. yeah, so it's a p-adic representation of the integers. Then you can compute n choose r, um, or not compute, uh, see what it's congruent to mod p by just looking at n choose r is congruent to n naught r naught n1 r1 mm. nk rk mod um, and you can use the same theorem to show that that's true. And um, is this easier than the way it's done in the normal number theory in group theory class? The two things that you showed us earlier? Um, for Roman's little theorem, I don't think it's easier because you have to go through this theorem itself, uh -huh. um, which I think you know, is. It looks really nice and everything, and like proof has like it's a nice proof, but like mm -hmm. you know, you, if you don't have this theorem, the hammer, then like Fermat's loop theorem is like probably easier than easier to like just do it another okay. way. But if you already have that, then it's obviously yeah. really really easy. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Do you know what that done, that theorem one? Um. No. Not really. I uh, well, I could date of this paper, but I don't know, I'm not sure if this is the first time this guy did it. So it's a uh, paper from 83, 1983. Um, I'm give the source by Melvin Hausman. And it says, what is it? Applications of a simple Technique 